Hi, I'm Brian Michael. I'm here at my bench at uh, Griffin Strings, and we're going to talk about some guitar maintenance procedures that'll keep your instrument playing nicely. This here is a humidifier that we like using, and it simply just slips between the strings, you know, to keep keep things like this from happening, like this dryness crack that happened. Yeah, most guitars, acoustic guitars, prefer a humidity range of between uh, 40 and 55 percent. And around here, that's about what it is, so we're lucky, but not everybody has that, uh, that option. So one of the easiest things you can do to keep your guitar happy is make sure it stays clean. And um, the easiest way to keep it clean is just to keep on top of it and do it often, and, you know, every time you play if, if you're able to. So I'm going to use some plastic cleaner here and spray it on a lint-free cloth, not directly on the instrument. And I'm just going to make some circular patterns to just kind of clean off the residual buildup that happens just from playing it or just dust that gathers. And one area in particular to pay special attention to is this part right here on the top where your arm usually rests when you play it because the oils from your skin can get into the finish and do some damage, especially if you have a lacquer guitar. If your guitar happens to have a lot of finish cracks in it, you might not want to use a, a liquid such as this to clean it with. You might just want to use a damp rag so that no liquid gets down into the, the cracks and gets absorbed into the wood. So now I'm going to clean the fingerboard on this guitar. The fingerboard can get a lot of gross buildup just from playing from time to time. You know, if you notice you've got little circular patterns forming or the, the fingerboard just doesn't look consistent, it probably needs to be cleaned. And so I like to use a toothbrush with the bristles cut down short to make it a little stiffer and uh, just regular old Formula 409. I like to hold the neck with a paper towel just to keep the excess from, you know, getting absorbed into the neck and just spray a little bit on the fingerboard in the area that needs to be cleaned. And just make some circular patterns like this until all the nasty stuff is gone. And you can wipe it from time to time and see how it looks, and, you know, just keep going until you can see on the paper towel I got some stuff off of there. And after the uh, Formula 409's dried off your neck and everything's looks, looks clean, I like to use some 4 aught steel wool to put a little bit of shine back in the frets and kind of even out the, the look of the fingerboard. And I simply run it along the grain line of the fingerboard over the frets and you can, you can be pretty aggressive because this steel wool is not going to take any material off these frets. It's, it's pretty fine stuff so all it'll do is just make them shine. Be careful around the guitar's top so you don't scratch it with the steel wool. And afterwards just blow it off. I, I luckily have an air compressor I'm going to go use. So here's how I like to restring a guitar. I'll be putting a new set of lights on this OM here. Start by loosening the strings with a string winder. And they can all be removed at once. You don't only have to do one. You know, if, if you have certain kinds of under the saddle pickups, you might want to only do one at a time. But this guitar does not fall into that category. So I'm going to take them all off at once. So once they're slack, I use my string cutters here as a and my fingers as a fulcrum. And I'm not actually prying on the bridge, I'm using my fingers as a fulcrum to remove the pins. And if you pull straight up, you don't have to worry about damaging your peg head. So I've got my bend in the string here. I like to put a bend in the string so that when the string is sitting inside the guitar, the pin won't catch the end of the ball, because the ball actually sits against the bridge plate and the pin just holds it forward. So. And I'm watching the winding as I push the pin down and making sure I don't see that winding disappear way down inside the guitar because that means the ball end is stuck under the pin. And how I like to wind them, to line the hole up with the length of the peg head and then push the string, <coughs> string through until it sticks out about an eighth of an inch. Start turning with my finger against it and make sure it gets a nice kink in it so it won't slip through. And then I go over the end of the string with the first strap and then underneath it with the next strap. And the only time I find it necessary to sort of tie the string is if I'm using a really small string like a 9 or a 10. As long as it's kinked, it'll, it'll stretch, to, it should stay without slipping. So now that I have the strings on the guitar and relatively in tune, I like to stretch them out like this by putting, putting them between my pinky and my thumb and kind of twisting them along the string. You can be pretty aggressive, but you don't want to be, you don't want to go too far. You can actually damage the string. And this really seats them, seats the ball ends against the bridge plate, and it seats the windings around the post to keep the strings in tune. So you shouldn't have to keep retuning if you do this properly the first time. 
So there are three major components to your guitar's action. Uh, one is the truss rod and the relief in the neck. One is the string height of the nut. And then the third is the height of the saddle. And here is <clears throat> how I like to check each one. I will start with the truss rod because I think that's the first place to start. <clears throat> and to do that, I hold the guitar up and then I make sure I'm holding the string down at the nut and at the body joint. And I'm actually using the string as a straight edge and seeing how far it moves in the middle of the neck around the seventh fret. And I can judge by eye that it, this is probably six or seven thousands, give or take, but I can also check with my feeler gauge if I'm not sure. Um, and that's about what I want on this guitar. Since it's a finger style guitar, I don't want a lot of forward bow. And to check the string height, the nut, what I like to do, oh, by the way, this is done with the strings all tuned up to pitch, to standard E tuning, make sure the right tension's on the guitar. Uh, to check the, the action of the nut, I simply hold down the string at the third fret, or between the second and third fret, and look for movement over the first fret. And the B string is just barely moving here. The E isn't really moving at all, so my nut slot is either too low or just on the borderline of being too low. And I'll go through each string and check all that and see if I have to raise or lower the, the nut slots. And once the truss rod is checked and where you want it and the nut is dialed in, the third thing is to check the saddle height because that's the main component of adjustment really for action height. And how I measure that is with a, a machinist ruler here with uh, 60 fourths of an inch increments. I measure between the top of the 12th fret and the bottom of the string at the low E and the high E. So here I'm getting you know, just strong of 3 32nds of an inch or uh, 6 64ths on the low E. And at the high E I'm getting just, just above um, 4 64ths or 2 32nds. So this is just a little high. So I think on this one I want to take the saddle down just a touch. So on this Martin here, I'm going to demo checking the truss rod and then making a small adjustment. So as I talked about before, I checked the relief on this one and I see that the string's moving a little bit more than I like in the middle, so the neck has a little too much forward bow. So I'm going to take my 5 millimeter wrench and on, on this Martin, the, the truss rod access is actually underneath the fingerboard down here. So I'm going to find that. Here we go. I'm going to tighten the rod, probably maybe a sixth of a turn here, just to see if that's enough. And I'll check it again. Sometimes I'll press on the neck gently just to kind of seat the truss rod. And that's more like it. That's what I want to see. Now, if the neck had been too straight, I would have I would have gone the other way with the rod. I would have loosened it a little bit and checked it. So tuning machines can be a, a problematic area on, on guitars when they when various parts of them become loose. Uh, they can cause rattles. And this one on these Old Grover Automatics, when the buttons come loose, the worm actually gets pulled out and makes the guitar impossible to tune. Um, so to address this, I first loosen the string, or to take it right off, and see the play in the gear, I'm just going to tighten it with a little flathead screwdriver until it's just snug. It's really important not to get these buttons too tight, or the little plastic washer that sits right here between the button and the metal collar can break. So you just want them snug. You know, getting these extra tight does not help your guitar stay in any better tune. Another good thing to check is if you have any loose uh, bushings. If the, if the washers underneath the bushings are loose, they can cause a lot of rattles set off by certain notes you play. So most of these tuners take a 10 millimeter wrench. The old Grovers are a, a 3 8 but a 10 millimeter works. And these, again, you just want them snug. You don't want to over tighten them because you can cause finish problems. Another good thing to check on the tuners while the strings are, are either off or very loose is that the, the mounting screws themselves are tight. You know, So for that, you just take a whatever screwdriver fits and just try to turn them. These, you, know, you want these pretty tight, but uh, if they feel like they're stripped, then you might want to do something about filling the hole in and redrilling it because it's important to keep those tuners tight on the back of the peg head. Now these gears on this particular Martin, they're vintage style, so they don't have a screw-in bushing. They have, they have a push-in bushing, but the washer and the bushing are two different pieces. They're not actually attached. And one thing we see a lot is these bushings becoming, they, they work their way out of the, the headstock a little bit, and then these little washers rattle like crazy, and they're really hard to find if you don't know what you're looking for. 
And if you do find one's loose, you just loosen up the string, take both your thumbnails and push it down. These are still pretty snug, so I think they'll be okay. And then tune it back up. If you find that they're, they just keep coming loose no matter what you do, sometimes a little bit of wood glue between the pushing bushing and the washer will you know, keep them stuck together but not permanently and it'll keep them from rattling. So your string, string action at the nut is very crucial for playability and intonation. Uh, typically you want it as low as possible without the open string note vibrating against the first fret. Um, if it's any higher than that, you're basically just fighting, fighting it and increasing the uh, sharpness of the note at the first fret or the whole first position area. So you want the strings really nice and low at the nut. And you want the slots filed, you know, just the right way so the string sounds nice and nice and uh, clear when you when you pick it. Uh, here are some typical nut files that we use around the shop here. Um, I think we get these from all parts, made in Japan, and they these each of these files is double sided and both sides are different. So there's basically six different sizes with three files, and I also have a single file from Stuart McDonald that I use for the really small strings on electric guitars. Here's how I go about lowering a nut slot. If I check this low E, it's a little bit high to me. It's moving a little bit more than I want. I'd loosen the string, pull it out of the way, and find the right nut file. And I want to hold it at a, a downward angle, similar to the angle of the peg head on this guitar because you want the highest portion of the slot to be right where it meets the end of the fingerboard. If, it's, if, the slot, if the slot ends up being flat like this, the string can kind of vibrate around in it and sound like a sitar and just not very clear. So really want to hold that file at a, a you know, 10 degree angle or so, I guess. And I'm just going to remove a little bit of material with it. <laughs> Blow it out. Tune it back up to pitch. Check my. That's more like it. Now suppose the the slot was too low, and you had a lot of open string buzz, and you needed to actually raise the slot. I mean, if the nut's in bad enough condition, you'd probably want to take it in and have a professional either make you a new nut or shim the existing nut up and kind of recarve it for you. But if there's just one or two slots that are low, I like to fill them using uh, bone dust, which baking soda works pretty much just as well and some thin super glue and this is the kind we like to use around here we use these little pipettes to apply the, the thin super glue which is really handy it keeps it from getting where you don't want it to and it's easier to use than a toothpick so I'm going to fill this low E nut slot for you here I'll show you how I like to do it take some bone dust on my palette knife here and get it down into the slot kind of pack it with my finger Blow away the excess if you don't want the super glue wicking down into the extra dust of it sitting on your peg head. <laughs> so I've got a little coating of dust in the bottom of that slot, which is what I want. And then I'll take my pipette with thin super glue and very carefully just put a drop in the bottom of the slot till it looks wet. Now normally, I'd let this sit probably overnight just to make sure it gets nice and hard because it, letting it sit overnight allows the glue and the uh, baking soda or bone dust to get hard enough where you can file it and the string won't kind of settle into it. But for uh, illustration purposes, I'll go ahead and, and do this right now for you. So I'm going to catalyze it using some super glue kicker here, which you can get at a hobby store. Makes the super glue dry immediately. Put my string back in the slot. I just used such a thin layer of bone dust that I didn't really change the geometry of the slot. It's not like I filled the whole slot in. You know, if I had done that, I'd have to take out my file and get it close before I did this part. But since I just used a little layer, I don't need to do that. So we're strung up to pitch here, and now I'm back to where I want to be. I've got a little bit of string movement over the first fret. It's not buzzing when I play with a moderate attack. If I really lay into it, I get a little bit of buzz, but it's comfortable to play like this, so that's, that's how I want it. Adjusting your saddle height is something you can do you know, pretty easily on your own, um, as long as the, the top of the saddle is the right shape. You know, you're just working with a flat surface on the bottom. So, on this particular guitar, 
the saddle sticking up a little over an eighth of an inch, and this is nice. I mean, this is kind of what you want if everything else works out. You know, the truss rod's adjusted correctly, the nut height's set. This is a nice, healthy amount of saddle sticking up above the bridge, and it's the desired action. So this is kind of the, you know, the perfect situation. Now, if you wanted to raise your saddle because your action was too low, this is an example of a little rosewood shim that I've glued on to the bottom of a bone saddle. And I just started with a thin piece of rosewood that was a little bigger than the, the saddle and then scraped it down with the razor blade after I glued it on. It, it was a veneer I began with. And this way, the saddle and the shim aren't two different pieces and it doesn't become unstable. You know, the bridge that this was used in was made of rosewood, so there's not much difference between having the shim and not having the shim, you know, tonally this way. And on the other hand, if I wanted to remove some material, I've made a scribe line on this saddle, which I'll show you how I do. So I'm going to take my, my machinist ruler here and scribe a line at, at 1 32nd of an inch. And I'll even measure it just to, on both ends, make sure I've got the right line right where I want it. It looks good. So now I've got a piece of 80 grit sandpaper here on my flat bench. And I'm just going to sand this saddle down till it's till the bone is gone, and I just hit the line. And be really careful to hold the saddle straight up and down. You don't want it leaning one way or another. And I'll just simply kind of go for it. I kind of check along the way and make sure things are sanding evenly. You know, you can put uh, pressure on one end more than the other to control kind of how much material you remove on one end versus the other. There, I've just hit my line, and now I'll pop it back in the, the guitar and string it up and see if I'm at the right action. So if your pickup's not working, there's a couple simple tests you can do yourself just to kind of see if it's something easy, and usually it is. More often than not, you know, it can be as simple as a battery not making proper contact with the uh, contacts here. Or it could be a dead battery, which it is a lot of the time. So, you know, if you replace your battery, make sure it's a, a new one for sure and not one you just found laying around. If your battery's good and it's, it's making good contact, I'd have a look inside maybe with an inspection mirror and see if you see any loose wires um, at the preamp or near the end pin jack or anywhere there's wires actually because they can loosen up over time. And if you do have a loose wire and you're comfortable soldering, you know, undo your output jack and, and solder it back together and see if that does it. And uh, if you're uncomfortable doing any of this kind of stuff, you know, it's always take it to someone who, who's a professional. You know, don't don't go messing around if you're not totally comfortable trying it yourself. Because there's people that do it for a living and can probably figure it out for you. So I hope you found these little video clips helpful. Uh, for more detailed descriptions of what I showed here, you can refer to my article in Acoustic Guitar on the, the do-it-yourself repairs. For Acoustic Guitar, this is Brian Michael.